This will be a video on moving from EEG to brain maps and then neurofeedback training. So first, what is a Z-score? Um, Z-scores are a special application of the transformation rules. The Z-score for an item tells you how far and in what direction that item deviates from its distribution's mean expressed in units of its distribution standard deviation. So if you remember back to statistics, um, if you have a population and you use this formula, you can transform it into a bell curve. So at the middle of that will be zero, and that will be the mean of the distribution. A z-score of one means that it's 34.13% above the mean. A negative z-score is negative 0.3413 from the mean. When you come out here, again, it's another 34.13%. So you're about at 68% here. And then out here, you're closer to about 97 or 98% when you hit three standard deviations. The importance of the z-scores are that most of us aren't right here at zero when we look at our z-scores for a particular activity in different parts of our brain. Generally, the population, you'll find 68% of the population will have measurements from negative one to one standard deviations, and then about 97 to 98% of the population will be included from minus two to positive two. So when we're talking about z-scores above two standard deviations or below two standard deviations, and we're talking about a pretty unusual activity, which then we consider clinically significant as well as statistically significant. So this is how z-scores are measured, and we're usually training z-scores at above or below two standard deviations and trying to move them closer to the mean. Sometimes we'll train these scores from one to two standard deviations if there isn't activity outside of here. But usually the larger the z-score in an absolute value, the more important it is to train that particular area. So we have a number of sophisticated databases which will take the raw electrical information and process it into brain maps that look like this. This right here is an example of um, something from NeuroGuide, which is from the ANI database. There are a number of important things when looking at here. So the key is right here. So zero is usually kind of this green right here. The warm colors are activity above the mean, and the cool colors are below the mean. So if we look through this, we can see you know different colors. So this is warmer or more activity. This would be particularly high activity, and there isn't a lot of low activity on this map. There's some low-ish and a little bit of lower activity there, but nothing that's this dark blue. So that's how we use the colors. Um, different maps have a different um, color bar right here. So it may be white or blue or any other color, but the code is right here. So we're looking at um, activity from delta to high beta. So delta are the lower wavelengths, high beta are the higher wavelengths. Some databases also look at gamma. So delta is 0 to 4 hertz, 4 to 8 hertz, 8 to 12, 12 to about 20 or 25, and then 20 to 25 up. The first bar here is the absolute power, which tells us the measurement of raw energy output at each site during recording compared to the normative database. So you remember from the earlier video that these are um, the 1020 system. So this is the front of the brain, back of the brain, left and right. This would be F1, F2, and so on, according to that. And then that tells us about frontal region activity, temporal, parietal, and occipital activity. So as we look through this, we consider the functions of each wavelength and what we're seeing. So for example, here we're seeing a little bit less delta activity than we would expect right here, a little more theta activity than we would expect in the frontal region, and a lot more high beta activity right here than we would expect. So that's something that we keep in mind when we're 
interpreting these maps. So there's absolute power. Relative power tells us the distribution of energy resources being utilized during the recording among the frequencies measured compared to the normative database. So basically right here is telling us a lot about resource allocation. So given that your the brain has the the number of power that it has. So up here it's showing us how much power a person has compared to the normative database. Here is telling us sort of how that person's brain is allocating resources, like how important that brain thinks that it is to allocate resources to a particular area. So this is mostly green, which is normal. So it's telling us that this brain is really allocating resources to Delta pretty normally. It thinks it's pretty important except for right here. And we see with this region right here, it's not allocating a lot of resources there, and it's actually not creating a lot of power here. So this tells us that not only is it not generating a lot of power, but it doesn't think it's that important to generate that much power. So that might be something that we would train based on what the person's symptoms are compared to the function of this particular site. When we look at theta, we'll see that there's some yellow or warm. So the brain's thinking this area of the brain is important to allocate a lot of resources to. And when we look up here, the activity is pretty normal. So the brain's having to like over allocate in a, in a sense to create normal activity. We see that there's more activity here than we would like. And the brain actually thinks it's important to make more activity there. So that might be something we would also address in training. When we look at the alpha, we can see that it's a little bit light blue here, meaning that the brain thinks it's just a little bit less important than we would expect. And you can see that it's actually creating a little bit less alpha. So again, if symptoms correlate, that's something we would focus on. When we look at the other ones, we see that the brain saying that it's important to allocate a lot of the beta resources to these areas. And in fact, it is because that's what it takes to produce sort of a normal beta activity. In the high beta region, it not only thinks it's important to allocate resources there, but it's putting a lot of power out there. So again, that might be something we would address. When we look at amplitude asymmetry, it tells us the average difference between signals measured compared to a normative database. So it's giving us information about communication from one part of the brain to another. At this time, this is not directional. So the thing that we can mostly conclude from this is that the brain has got some inefficient patterns of communication going on that could be trained to create more efficient communication. All of these lower pictures down here are talking about sharing of information and um, resource allocation, resource and resourcing in the brain. So if you see any lines down here, it's telling us that something's less efficient than it could be. When we look at coherence and phase lag, so coherence is a variability of neural activation and delay between sites compared to the normative database. So it's telling us about the rate of shared information. So it's telling us basically how these parts of the brain are sharing information with each other. And if we look down here, we can see that this is more than we would expect. The blue is less than we would expect. So these areas of the brain are sharing more information with each other than we would expect. These parts are sharing less information. So that can be then correlated to symptoms like this part of the brain is kind of locked up in a sense of sharing information, maybe a little bit more than it should. And this area is maybe not sharing as much information as it should. The exciting point is that we can train this coherence either up or down, or we can train it towards um, a norm. So we can make the brain more efficient in its information processing. The phase lag is the average of the delay between processing sites compared to normative database. So it's the speed of shared information, which also sort of is a measure of um, how fast or how slow resource recruitment is. So You've heard the saying probably that neurons that fire together wire together or neurons that wire together fire together. So when different nerve nerves or neurons, usually groups of neurons, are in a task, they're all firing together. They will fire together or come together to create a task, but then they need to decouple from each other and get into different arrangements of neurons for the next task. 
So fe is like a sort of a measure of this. So when a task is complete, um, the, neur the neuron will need to recruit neighbors to process or do the next task efficiently. If it's red here, it means that it's taking too long to do that. So it's inefficient because it's taking longer than is the most efficient. If it's blue here, it means it's not taking quite enough time. So basically it's gonna start the task without having enough neighboring neurons um, recruited. So the importance of these is really in knowing that if you see lines here, the communication is not as efficient as it could be, and therefore it's another possible thing that we would target during neurofeedback training. We can also map deep brain structures with the 19 channels. Um, this is very exciting because it's, it hasn't been available in the past. So S. Loretta is an algorithm used to determine the current source density or electrical activity of 3D areas of deeper structures such as Brodmann areas, which we'll see in just a minute. The S. Loretta calculation takes information about the brain's surface electrical activity to determine what the deeper brain structures or sources are doing electrically. This information can also be compared to a normative database to provide clinically useful information about a patient's brain function. And it's very exciting because we can also train these sites and this allows us to train um, very fine tuned functions such as letter recognition or word comprehension or other very fine activities that the brain performs. This is a um, map of um, different parts of the brain and different Broadman areas. So this just gives you an example of how the Broadman areas are. So again, we're in the frontal region, um, some of the parietal region, temporal region, and occipital region. You can see that if you see Broadman area 21, this is where it is located. So this gives you just an example of where different parts of the brain are topographically. And then we know what the different functions of these areas are. So we can look at your brain's activity in these particular areas, compare it to your symptoms, and then train either these areas individually or in groups of networks to increase your functioning. So this is how we go from the brain maps to training. So based on the patient's brain maps and clinical presentation, we select particular training protocols. These training protocols utilize operant conditioning. So you remember Pavlov's dogs, where Pavlov basically trained his dogs to salivate at a bell by first pairing the bell with meat. So the patient gets a reward when their brain acts in the more desired way. So we basically catch your brain doing the right thing and give it a reward, which then encourages more of that particular behavior. The rewards are both auditory and visual. The um, auditory is generally in the sound of music. The brain likes higher notes and we like more continuous sound. So both of these happen when you're meeting more of the criteria we want to. We also provide um, visual rewards, and these can be by watching a video that gets brighter and more easy to see as you're meeting more criteria, or a video game. And so from this, the brain learns and changes its behavior. And actually, you wouldn't be aware of doing much. You would just be consciously aware of watching the movie or listening to the music or both, and your brain will make the changes, which we can measure. So this is a picture of somebody capped up and ready to do neurofeedback training.